Namaste. So many traditions use the image of the seeker as a transcendental hero uh, who conquers over the maya of the three worlds with meditation. This is an image that we find in so many spiritual traditions, scriptures, teachings, and so on. And it even became commercialized as the hero's journey, huh? which is just a, a basic plot structure for movies, which became very popular with producers and writers. So we see a lot of movies following this template, this this archetype. And if we go back and look at spiritual practices, spiritual traditions, many of them will cast the seeker or the guru, the self-realized person, in the role of the all-conquering hero. Huh? For example, the first tradition that I got involved in was the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. And they address their sannyasis as Maharaj. Maharaj means great king. He's the sannyasi. He's renounced, or supposed to be anyway. <laughs> the reality wasn't quite matching up with the doctrine, but anyway. The Maharaj, where does that come from? This person's supposed to have no possessions of their own and simply travel and live very simply and teach. So why are they addressed as Maharaja? Well, a Raja is a king. And to be a king, you have to conquer your enemies. That's the only way to become a king. Unless you inherit being a king from your family. But the idea is that the seeker who is successful conquers what? The senses. That's the image of the sannyasi as a great king, Maharaj. What is going on here? What, what is really the meaning of the transcendental hero, the spiritual hero? And who is it actually that he's fighting and, and what is it? How does it all work under the hood? You know, you know I like to analyze things this way. Well, we live in a world which is an illusion. And the reason it's an illusion is that it's temporary. It's impermanent. It's always changing. Take any of the objects in this world. None of them remain the same for very long. And life becomes a struggle, really, to capture the moment to create the situation that matches our desires. But of course, this is a losing game. <laughs> it's losing because these objects that we want so much and that we're so attached to are impermanent. And even if they totally match our desires, there's always something wrong, you know? There's something that's out of spec. So what is it? It goes all the way back to the fundamental ignorance that led us to particularize and individualize ourselves from Brahman into a, a limited individual and then accept a body and senses and so on. And karma. See? We want the body and the senses. Why? To enjoy. Huh? We create an ego that this is my body, these are my senses, uh, this is my world, and these different objects of my senses are for my enjoyment. They're my possessions, my things. Huh? And then we're always struggling to keep up our collection of my things 
to match our desires. But there's this problem, there's karma. See, the, the ignorance, the, the fundamental ignorance is threefold. It's desire, aversion, and delusion. The desire is the lust to enjoy sense objects. The aversion is trying to avoid the negative consequences of that. And the delusion is that we are an individual and that we are a doer, an owner, an enjoyer, and so on. In other words, false ego. So uh, under the circumstances, how can we really enjoy all this? It's not possible. It always leads to negative consequences. In our case, repeated birth and death in a variety of material bodies, from Brahma all the way down to a tiny bacteria. <laughs> so why do we keep on why do we keep going? Why do we keep renewing this game? Why don't we just stop? And of course, the answer is we're in delusion. We think we can make this work. Oh, if I try just one more time, huh? maybe I can get it right. But it's never right. And that's because the nature of maya, uh, not the philosophical analysis of maya as illusion, that's well known, but the functional analysis of maya is the false promise, the bad deal. In other words, cheating. Uh, you give me this today, and I'll give you that tomorrow. See? And because of our greed, we want that. Huh? And we're ready to give this, whatever it is, today to get it. And of course, the cheating business is that the person making the promise is going to cheat you. <laughs> it's not going to give you what they have promised to give. Like a beautiful man or woman looks so attractive, right? And we think, oh, I can have this, I can enjoy this. This is going to be very nice, right? But what always happens is that there's some downside. There's something they haven't told you, you know? Yeah, this used car belonged to a little old lady who only used it to go to church on Sundays, right? But what they don't tell you is that her church was 200 miles away. <laughs> so there's always something. There's always a gotcha. There's always a catch. There's always an angle. See, and this is called the con, the confidence game that I'll make you a promise that sounds so good, you just can't resist giving me whatever I demand in exchange. Uh, let me, let's get married. Huh? This is a good one. Let's get married and I'll give you this and this and that and that and that in the future in return for your promise today. Is this ever a good deal? I don't think so. <laughs> it certainly wasn't in my experience and the experience of, I think, just about everybody. There's always something wrong, you know? There's always something the prospective partner hides from you. Like with my first wife, she didn't inform me that she's an alcoholic. And none of the people around her that knew her would tell me. I think they just wanted to get rid of her. <laughs> so dumb young me, you know, I marry her, take her off to California. And then when we had some troubles, of course she started drinking. So 
In fact, she died from it. So that's, you know, the kind of thing that happens all the time, right? You go into a, a store or a shop and you want to purchase something. Well, of course, you're never going to get your money's worth because the shop owner has to make a profit. The distributor has to make a profit. The manufacturer has to make a profit. If it's food, the farmer has to make a profit. Everybody between you and the actual source of the product has to make a profit. So you get cheated. The people are so used to being cheated. People are so like complacent about it. It's like, oh yeah, cheated again. Okay, here's the money, you know. And they just pay because they want the thing that's being offered even at the cost of being cheated. This is lust. So the hero, the spiritual hero, has to confront and defeat all these false promises. And how does he do it? Well, he has two great weapons. One is knowledge, and the other is detachment. Through knowledge, he knows that actually he's not the enjoyer. He's actually not the possessor, not the doer, not the thinker, the knower, or even the desirer. That's all the mind, simply the mind. And he also knows that whatever the deal that's being offered, no matter how attractive, how wonderful it sounds, he's going to be cheated. This is knowledge. And then the other side is renunciation, detachment. Knowing that, why should I sign up for this deal when I know I'm not getting what it's worth? When I know I'm going to be cheated, I'm going to be ripped off, betrayed, whatever. Why? Because this is the world of Maya. The whole world is based on a lie. And the lie is, this is beautiful and we're going to enjoy it. But what really happens is, you get have to go through birth and death again and again and again. And that's no fun. But we do it because we're lured by the promises, the false promises that we're going to enjoy. So anyone who is strong enough in knowledge and steady in renunciation and detachment can defeat these. How? By simply doing nothing. By not taking the bait. By tolerating the desires like hunger and thirst. Why do you think so many spiritual paths include fasting? To uh, build up a tolerance for hunger and thirst. Fasting on Ekadashi, fasting on holy days. This is done so that you become strong in tolerating desire. Because desire is going to be there. The mind always wants this and that. The senses are always crying out for attention and fulfillment. But if you can tolerate them without being disturbed, you become the great hero who conquers the maya, the illusion of this material world, and attains to the position of the Maharaja, huh? the great king. It doesn't mean that he has any kingdom in this world, but rather he becomes pure consciousness, pure awareness, 
And that is the transcendental hero. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.